I think there are three areas of research right now that seem to be most promising. Uh, one is uh, research into infectious agents that may play a role in this illness. None have yet been conclusively shown to be a cause of this illness, but it's possible. Second, immune system changes that may be playing a role in this illness. There are several already that have been identified, and there may be more to be discovered. And a third very exciting area is changes in brain hormones or brain chemicals that uh, could influence the immune system, could influence viruses that are already in the body. And these, these are areas where there's already a lot of research that's underway. The most pressing question is, what is the cause of syphids? Well, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, no one knows what the cause of this condition is. And there's a lot of controversy about it. And it's analogous to the first uh, uh, meetings again with HIV that we had in 1983, where the ecologists were saying it's toxins in the air, and the, the um, Epstein-Barr people were saying it's Epstein-Barr, and the fungus people were saying it was fungus. I mean, all these same arguments aired in 1983 when there was another new and mysterious illness floating around. The point is, there's still a lot of research to do. And people have to perceive this illness first uh, as real, which has been a struggle. Second, as uh, complicated and deserving a very in-depth and careful approach that's going to take years to accomplish. Another question that especially worries patients and people close to them is, is syphids contagious? And people with syphids do have terror about it. They think, should I be around this baby? Should I be around this family? Am I typhoid Mary? Is everyone going to catch this disease from me? The disease is not contagious. That, the, that we think the agent that causes disease is everywhere. And many people have already been infected, and they don't show any signs of the disease. It depends on the genetic makeup of the individual or where their immune system at, is at the time that the agent enters. So I don't see any real reason to be telling people you can't be around people with chronic fatigue or chronic fatigue people. No, you can't be around society. The bigger risk is actually to the chronic fatigue patient from the infections that society carries, their colds and the flutes. Despite what the experts say, SIFID's advocates aren't so sure. This is probably an infectious disease. We know that because we've seen whole towns full of people come down with it. We've seen families come down with it. We've seen groups of people in the workforce come down with it. Now, what we always say is the majority of people with syphids aren't around other people who have it, which means that on some level, everybody's not getting it. Maybe everybody's getting it and they're not symptomatic. But what we know is somehow it's passing through the population. So what is known about syphids? Very little. Researchers have observed both immune system overactivation and under-response, endocrine abnormalities, and viral activity. With so little known, what can be done for the syphids patient? It's uh, very important that chronic fatigue syndrome patients uh, or people who think they have chronic fatigue syndrome not try to self-diagnose this illness because there are lots of other uh, known medical illnesses which may be treatable if caught in time, which can start off with just plain fatigue for a while or with symptoms like CFS. First thing is to diagnose, because when someone's going in to their doctor's office with all these symptoms, they have the most god-awful thoughts in the back of their mind. I know in my case, one of the happiest days of my life, in fact, the happiest day except for the birth of my children was the day I was told I had an incurable illness, this disease, because I didn't know what was the matter with me. But diagnosis is no simple matter. Syphilis patients are very difficult, amongst other reasons, because they look so good. You have someone who you hear is uh, unemployed for three months on disability, who can't get out of bed. They come into your office, and you come in to see them, and they look normal. When you do your physical examination, there are a minimal amount of changes that you can see on the physical examination. When you proceed to the laboratory, the same is true. There are very little things, that, very few things that you can see on the laboratory. A routine blood count will probably be normal. Routine chemistries, probably be normal. Um, thyroid tests, probably normal. There is no diagnostic blood test or imaging test available that says you have or do not have the disease. Such a test does not exist. Nor is there a known cure. 
The best patients can hope for now is relief of symptoms, such as pain, weakness, depression, sleep disturbance. Some treatments aim to intervene in the disease process using immune modulators or antiviral drugs, such as gamma globulin and acyclovir. And many patients try to strengthen their overall resistance through nutritional supplements, getting plenty of rest, and simplifying their lifestyle. Dissatisfied with the care they have received from Western medicine, many CIFIDS patients have turned to non-traditional alternatives. Many people who have this disease are so sick and so desperate, they sort of end up saying, I will do anything. <laughs> I will eat, you know, swamp grass <laughs> if it will make me feel better. You find yourself going to alternative doctors, seeking alternative medicine, um, because a lot of people in standard medicine are not terribly sympathetic. My doctor was sympathetic, but he did not have a lot to offer me. It, it must be cr crazy for somebody to see all of these pills and to think that somebody actually takes these things almost on a daily basis. Um, but if your back is against the wall and you have a very serious illness, you're willing to experiment with just about anything. And that's what I've been forced to do. Like traditional treatments, alternative therapies seem to help some people with CIFIDs, but not everyone. Only one drug has been tested on an experimental basis. That drug is Amplogen, an immune-modulating antiviral drug patented by Hem Pharmaceutical. We tried it out at the clear blue sky back in 1987 on the first patient who was my absolutely most severely affected patient who couldn't even walk down the hallway and had to be carried in on a stretcher for her uh, infusions. Well, you found me with not a stitch on, totally out on the floor in the uh, bathroom. And then as I came to, I had a seizure. But I remember coming to about 15 or 20 minutes later, and Gloria was on the phone saying, Reed, Reed, I think we're going to lose this one. Don't try to get the drug for me. I'll wait till later, but if we don't get it for Nancy, there won't be any Nancy. And I remember laying there thinking, oh my God, do you think there may be a chance that I may live? About two weeks into her therapy, she started walking, and I, I couldn't believe it. I thought, this is bizarre, you know. A miracle has happened, or else there's something in this drug, one of the two. I have been on the Amplogen for almost two years, and my health is, is so restored compared to what it was that it is, it's, it's, a, it's amazing, it's a miracle. Amplogen has just, just changed my life. I now, my very last psychometric, I use both hands together. I can count 10 numbers backwards. Um, I still have problems. I'm not cured, but life is better. Despite promising results, the FDA did not approve Amplogen for treatment of CIFIDs, and HEM terminated its Amplogen trials. Without Amplogen, most patients deteriorated rapidly. Many became completely disabled. Some lost hope. Several committed suicide. With an effective treatment for their illness apparently available but unobtainable, all felt cheated by him, the FDA, and the healthcare system. I was in the 502 study. Uh, it was a 50-50 chance. I knew either I had the opportunity to receive the drug or placebo. Unfortunately, I shot up toilet water twice a week. The consent form read that uh, at the end of this trial that those who were on Amplogen would be retained. Those who were not on Amplogen uh, would be switched over. It's now been well over a year, a year and several months, and those patients are still not on Amplogen. But I was under the impression that if I, you know, joined the study, gave them my body, heart, soul, and mind for a solid year so they could do whatever they wanted with it, then I would be guaranteed this drug for a lifetime. There simply is a limit to what we can do and, and, and reach a primary mission for which we have shareholders. We get in any month 1,000 to 3,000 phone calls. We receive many calls from uh, senators, congressmen, etc. We have no way to deal with the, the tens of thousands of letters and requests that we've gotten. 
the whole problem in Ampligen, uh, the, this legal issue is this conflict between the individual's right to be treated uh, and then the, the, the uh, scientific issues involved that must be addressed before this drug is released to literally anyone. It's like a, the military. In the military, individuals uh, are sacrificed for the greater good of the whole. What does it take to get a drug approved? Uh, lots of money. And uh, the ability to influence people um, both sides of the law. The difficulty is we don't have the money to spend on the attorneys and the clerks and all the, all the things that are necessary in order to get it through the Food and Drug Administration. So we don't have the money to invest in the politics, basically.